All right, um, it's good to see you all. I'm very glad you're here. I enjoy talking to students. It's uh, not unusual for me to do this. I do uh, occasionally fill in at the School of, uh, whatever it's called now, Theology and Christian Ministry. It used to be the School of Religion. Um, sometimes I fill in there. Okay, I'm not gonna call it that, but uh, I'll have to think about that. After, after this talk, I'll think about that. Um, also, uh, if you, any, have any of you, I don't know if you are far enough along yet, been to England for the study abroad? But every year before the group goes to England, they come here on a Thursday and I give them a talk on uh, religion in Great Britain and uh, give them kind of an overview of Anglican liturgy. And then they uh, have church with us and then they go within a few days to England. So uh, my point is we are used to having students here. We have students here every Sunday for church. Um, we have uh, students in the choir. So um, we like to have an active relationship with Lee and do. And I'm glad you all now can be a part of that. So let's pray before we start. Lord, thank you for the students. Thank you, Lord, for their professor. Thank you, Lord, for Lee University. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the relationship that uh, exists between St. Luke's and Lee. Help us always, Lord, to remember that uh, we are all your servants and we're uh, here, Lord, to help one another and to um, be there for each other as we walk um, our journeys of faith. So bless, Lord, our discussion today, and I hope this is only the beginning of um, perhaps some new insights and new interest uh, for these students and all of us in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I want to uh, give a very informal talk to you. I'd like this to feel conversational. I will open it up for Q&A uh, once I find out how long do we have. One o'clock. Well, you won't be here until one o'clock, so uh, you're going to get a few minutes off today. But that means we're not rushed, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. Okay, um, so this is not a lecture. It's a conversation I hope we can enjoy together. Very informal. When you walked in a few minutes ago, I don't know what you did. I hope you looked up or at least look forward. This isn't that tall a building, but it's tall enough. But when you came in, whatever you were talking about, and where's Dr. Reynoso and, and all that, I hope your eyes just naturally went up. Whether you thought about it or not, hey, my eyes are going up. I don't know, I don't assume you thought that. But that's what this space is meant to do. When you come in here, this space is meant to speak to you. This is not the grocery store. It's important as the grocery store is. This is not the gym. As important as the gym is. This is sacred space. So this is not a multi-purpose building. Multi-purpose buildings have their function. It's great to be able to fit a space for a dinner and then a concert and then a lecture or whatever. Multi-function spaces are great. But that's not what this is. And so from the time you walked in, the architect, whom we'll talk about in a minute, meant for your eyes to go up, again, or at least forward, so that when you come in, you're not just sort of aimlessly looking around. If you were, that's okay, but the, the structure is meant to draw your attention up, and forward, where you see the altar front and center, and then the wording, holy, holy, holy. Now those words fit anywhere in here, but they're placed there. 
And that's not an accident because the altar in a church of this style is meant to be the focus of our attention ultimately. So the pulpit is here. It has its place, very important place in liturgy. The lectern is here. This is where the scriptures are read and the prayers are offered. So that we balance what we think of as word, the scriptures, and the preaching, and the teaching, and sacrament. So this balance of lectern and pulpit, word, is balanced by and focuses toward sacrament, the altar. Okay? So the style of this building is what's called American Gothic or Carpenter Gothic, which uh, sort of 1840 to 1870. And the whole point about American or Carpenter Gothic vis-a-vis Gothic is the work primarily was done in wood rather than stone. If you, one of my hobbies is over the years I've been to 31 of the 41 English cathedrals, Anglican cathedrals. That's not bad, is it, for somebody from Tennessee? 31 of 41 is pretty good. It's a lot of Brit Rail passes back in the day, a lot of train trips out from London or York or Salisbury or somewhere. When you go to the medieval cathedrals in England, you see Gothic. You see a recognizable relationship to this, except the Gothic is in stone. Even the roof is in stone, whereas this is wood. We had a lot of wood available in this country in the 19th century. So in a Gothic cathedral, you'll see amazingly intricate carvings in stone. And here you see it in wood. I'm going to invite you at the end to just walk around in here. And I hope you'll take the time to notice the detail in the carving. Just look at how detailed this chair is where I sit on Sundays. And notice that it's not just any sort of design, is it? It's intricate. And notice how even this, it's at an angle leading up. But just notice later on just the detail in the carvings and how much care would have gone into that. So this is not the first church property for the Episcopal Church. Uh, the original mission work was done in 1867, just after the Civil War. It, the mission was called St. Albans. Alban is the first martyr in Britain. And so the American Episcopal Church comes from the Church of England. So there's always back and forth. Um, this lectern was donated um, from England, for instance. Uh, but St. Albans Mission started here in 1867. Uh, for a time it met in the Presbyterian Church. The oldest church building in Cleveland is First Presbyterian. There is an older wooden church in uh, Charleston, just down the road here. Um, but the oldest brick church is First Presbyterian, and then St. Luke's um, comes along after that this building, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I've got for you a church calendar, a real church calendar for 2022. People don't think so much anymore about the church calendar. We just think about the calendar, and we go to our phone, and we find our date. I still have a paper calendar. I don't have a flip phone, so I don't do my calendar on my phone. Most people just go to their phone, don't we, and, and do our calendars. But for hundreds of years, there's been a church calendar, or sometimes called a liturgical calendar. And the church calendar marks off saints' days with red ink. The term red-letter days will go out of use at some point, I suspect, because people don't look at calendars like this anymore. But if something happens the day you're baptized, married, confirmed, uh, what, graduate? Um, I don't know if you all would use the term or not. Um, Somebody my age would say it was a red-letter day. 
somebody older than me would say it more than I do, because I'm not that old. Uh, a red letter day. Well, that comes from the calendar. Saints days are in red. So it happens to be October, and so October 18th is in red. This is St. Luke's day. St. Luke is remembered in the church or liturgical calendar on October 18th. And so on October 18th in 1871, a little girl named Nina Craig Miles was killed in an accident with a train. Her grandfather um, and she were um, killed at a railroad crossing. Uh, people weren't used to railroad crossings yet in 1871 here in this rural area. And so little Nina was killed on St. Luke's Day and her family attended church here. And so the mausoleum that's behind the church, which is very rare for this area, the intricacies of mausoleums are not my specialty, but people who know say it's, it's very unusual in this area. I mean, this is unique. For, for a certain square mileage around Bradley County. The mausoleum houses um, Nina and a select uh, number of people in her family. I'm just giving you a time frame and then we're gonna talk about the structure. So that's in 1871 when little Nina died. And so her parents decided to build a church in her memory. The church in Cleveland was still just kind of a mission, meeting uh, where it could before the building of this church. And so they contracted, here's the point about the architect, a man named Peter J. Williamson, who uh, came to this area from Wisconsin, had fought in the Union Army, had fought on behalf of the Union Army at the Battle of Missionary Ridge, just over in uh, Chattanooga, and had been with Sherman in his campaign marching toward Atlanta. Peter J. Williamson settled in Tennessee after the war. And you can Google Peter J. Williamson, architect, and it'll come up very easily. He's worthy of Wikipedia. And Williamson really is the architect for some of the prominent buildings in Tennessee in the latter part of the 19th century. And there's a segment on uh, the article about him that says National Register of Historic Places that are his buildings and St. Luke's Church will come up as one of the seven uh, buildings that's, that are on the National Register that Williamson designed. So the family went to the best architect in Tennessee is the point, to design a church that would speak to the sacredness of God and would honor the uh, tragic death of their daughter. A man who worked for Peter Williamson designed the Grand Ole Opry. Williamson himself didn't design it, but a man who worked for Williamson designed one of the great buildings uh, in Tennessee. But certainly uh, many other buildings are attributed to Williamson. So the groundbreaking happened on August 5th, 1872. The cornerstone is set October 2nd, 1862. I'm not just throwing dates at you. They built this church within three years from Nina's death to the, uh, the first worship service in here was December 28, 1873. And that is Holy Innocence Day in the church calendar. We remember the male children that Herod had slain um, in fear that uh, the Messiah had been born. It's called the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And so just think about the relationship of what happened to little Nina and uh, the theology of Holy Innocence Day. So on um, December 28, just after Christmas, 1873, the first liturgy happens in this space. Just imagine a church that would have to have gas lights instead of electric. And even now, I think every time a siren roars by or somebody on their motorcycles showing off what it can do out here, I think people in 1873 couldn't have imagined, you know, what is that? What would they have heard? The clip-clop of horses in 1873. 
It's always interesting to me how, how quickly, easily, thoroughly, the noise out there comes through these walls. It wasn't built to keep out sirens and um, pressure washers. And some guy was pressure washing out here one Sunday morning several years ago, and you couldn't hear yourself thinking here. The pressure washer. Um, the church was built in a time when the noise would have been um, horses coming and going. But people have worshipped in this space since 1873. And then the consecration happened, the official dedication, on October 18, 1874. Again, St. Luke's Day. So um, the dates in and of themselves don't matter. I'm trying to paint a picture for you of the tie of this church to the calendar. And the calendar, of course, in the end is just a set of papers. It's what the calendar represents, that there's a rhythm to the year. There's a rhythm to the church. And there's a time throughout the year to remember different people and different occasions. Okay? All right. So the font here comes from October 18th, St. Luke's Day, 1876. So this is uh, a marble similar enough to the Carrera marble that um, makes up the mausoleum. The mausoleum, uh, I don't know if you've ever known this or care, um, but the mausoleum gets national attention um, because of the issue of whether or not it's haunted. And um, you can Google St. Luke's Mausoleum, Cleveland, Tennessee, and all kinds of stuff, seriously, all kinds of stuff will come up. And uh, people get off the interstate and come and, and check out the mausoleum. And not as much as they used to, interestingly enough. But um, the mausoleum gets national attention in its own right. We open it up on Easter Day, and so I do invite you to come to church on Easter Day if you'd like. And uh, the that's the one day of the year the mausoleum's open, and we put flowers in there, and it's a lovely part of our celebration of Easter. So one of the ways that churches are grouped, uh, we can think of the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, and the Anglican Church as having a similar theological and liturgical orientation. If you uh, cared anything about the Queen's death recently, and the liturgies, those were Anglican liturgies. Those were liturgies of the Church of England. It's very interesting how many people are saying in light of all those ceremonies, how beautiful the ceremonies were, how dignified the ceremonies were, how wonderful they were. And of course, I'm listening all the while. Is anybody gonna call this worship instead of ceremonies? It was all worship. The service of the reception of the body in Westminster Hall, the ceremony that everybody said was so beautiful, was in fact a worship service. The funeral in Westminster Abbey was not a state ceremony. It was a service of worship in an Anglican church. And the beautiful ceremony at Windsor was again a service of worship. And so Anglican churches, Orthodox churches, and Roman Catholic churches have a similar orientation around two things. We have an understanding of what is called apostolic succession, that our bishops, our overseers, can trace their spiritual lineage all the way back to the apostles, and that there has been an unbroken chain of laying on of hands when bishops are ordained that goes all the way back to Jesus and the disciples. So Catholic churches believe this theology, Orthodox churches and Anglican churches. And we also have our worship life then centered on the Lord's Supper. Every Sunday, frequently during the week, multiple times on Sundays in most churches. And so the theology of connecting back to the disciples themselves and Jesus himself is played out in what we call apostolic succession. 
I grew up in a church that had the Lord's Supper four times a year and um, had a different theology of what was happening than we do here. So uh, some of you may come from churches where you don't have the Lord's Supper quite so often. I want to be absolutely clear, I'm not criticizing that. There are many different ways to worship God, and we're all sisters and brothers in Christ. Uh, but each church has its own distinctive culture and a theological and liturgical orientation. And so when you came in today, and again, I hope you looked up or at least looked forward, what you're looking at is where our most important function takes place, the Eucharist, the sacred meal that Jesus initiated with his disciples. And so the altar is meant to remind us of the upper room and the table that the disciples and Jesus would have gathered around. The reason churches like the Catholic and the Orthodox and the Anglican, and there certainly are other traditions that have the Lord's Supper every week, but, but the three I'm talking about are the largest uh, traditions. What we uh, are proclaiming in the Eucharist is what we call, we call it different things, but the theology is real presence. The Catholic Church talks about transubstantiation. But Anglicans and Orthodox and Catholics believe that through the Eucharistic prayer, our Lord's presence, which is with us right now, we think the Spirit's with us everywhere and all times. But we think that when we pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, the Spirit of Christ comes to us in, in what we call a localized way, that is, in the bread and wine that we consecrate as the body and blood of Christ. And so all the architecture, the, the big point we're trying to make today is all of this architecture. We could look at the arches in the windows. We can talk about the ceiling. We can talk about the carving. Um, et cetera, we can talk about the colors. Why is this green and not blue, these hangings up here? But all of this, in the end, exists so that we can do this. Gather around the table and pray the prayer and have the Spirit of Christ come to us in the elements of bread and wine and then we can share them with each other in continuity all the way back to the disciples. So again, that's, that's the theology of, of real presence in the uh, bread and wine. It's why people, when they get out of their pews to come to communion, they'll typically either bow. Some people will still genuflect. You don't see that as often anymore. Um, but we do that to recognize that we're approaching a holy meal. Not just, we're not just having a reminder that Jesus had supper with his disciples. We believe that we're actually in continuity with that first Lord's Supper um, in the upper room. So you'll notice a light on up here in this uh, vessel um, in medieval churches with stone floors and walls. Oftentimes it's a real candle. Uh, this is electrified here. But underneath, and you can get up later and see this, underneath that red vessel with the light is a little box. We call that the ombre, or it's called the tabernacle in some churches. They're, they're synonyms. And in the box, in the ombre or the tabernacle, are consecrated elements of bread and wine. And we take those to the sick and the shut-in. And if we need extra on a Sunday morning, we just open the box and get some extra. And um, the light is on to recognize that we, we believe that because the elements of bread and wine have been consecrated at the altar, that the Spirit of Christ is present in a localized way. Again, the Spirit of Christ is with us right now. The Spirit of Christ is with us when we leave in a little while. But we think that the Spirit comes in a localized way in the Eucharist. And so even the elements that are housed for later use um, are given the honor of having a light on 
to symbolize the presence of Christ in those consecrated elements. All right? There is a chair up here on the left I want you to notice. It's a little bit different from the chair in the right corner. Um, this is, uh, and you can look at it later, there's a representation at the top of this chair of a mitre, the hat that the bishop wears. And so this is the cathedra. This is the chair where the bishop sits when he or she, and it's a he right now in this diocese. We have had women bishops for uh, many years now in the Episcopal Church. But when the bishop comes, um, the bishop sits in the cathedra, and uh, that represents even on a quiet Tuesday morning that we are an Episcopal Church and that we do have bishops, overseers, um, that trace their lineage back to the apostles. The Church of God also has uh, bishops. Bishops are a scriptural office. Uh, the office of bishop is clearly present in the New Testament. Um, sometimes in the Pentecostal tradition, um, bishops are referred to as overseers, which is the definition. That's what a bishop is. A bishop is an overseer. Uh, but overseers in the uh, Pentecostal tradition are similar to uh, what we know as bishops, except there's less emphasis in the Pentecostal tradition on what we would call apostolic succession. Okay? But these are uh, things upon which reasonable people uh, should be able to differ with uh, kindness and generosity, and we certainly hope that that's our attitude here. So I wanna, I've, I've used the word liturgy some. I want to talk about that uh, for just a minute. Liturgy has come to be understood as describing formalized worship, uh, sort of written prayers. Um, and you should show up on Sunday having a pretty good idea of, of how the service is going to look and feel. So how words are used is ultimately what matters. Um, I have a friend who's a linguist uh, with his PhD in linguistics, and every time I used to ask him about uh, a word, he'd say usage. How it's used is what it means. And so people typically think of liturgy as referring to a formal, written kind of language for worship. I'm going to offer you an expanded definition. Um, liturgy is a transliteration in English of a Greek word that means the people's work. So really anything that's done toward worship is liturgy. So North Cleveland Church of God, I would argue, has a liturgy in the same way that St. Luke's Episcopal does. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel quite the same on a Sunday. But I would argue that North Cleveland is just as liturgical as we are when you really press the definition of the word. But the word isn't used like that, typically. Typically, it's used to mean more formal worship. But I just want you to think in terms of just because a worship service isn't formalized doesn't mean it's not liturgy. The liturgy I grew up with was we started at 11 o'clock. The preacher said an opening prayer. There was a reading or two from scripture. Uh, the choir did an anthem. We sang a hymn or two. Um, we said some prayers that typically were led by the preacher. We took up an offering, of course. And then we had preaching. And then we had the invitational hymn at the end. And I would argue that's just as liturgical as what we do here with our Book of Common Prayer. It's the work of the people. But typically the word means, is used as referring to a more formal way of worship. What I want you to think about, though, is not thinking of formal as in any way less lively or less life-giving than spontaneous or extemporaneous. Just because something's formalized doesn't mean it lacks the life or that it necessarily lacks spontaneity. There's something different every Sunday here. There are elements of Sunday morning that have never been done before. 
a sermon that's never hit quite that angle, the interaction of the reader with the people. So it's different every week. But there is a sort of set way that we prepare for worship. And we think that that gives worship. We're free because we know the basic structure each week. We're free not to worry about, well, what's going to happen today? We kind of know what's going to happen in outline or in framework. But what happens in the individual heart is up to the individual and God each week. And we never know um, when, what Sunday something's going to click in a way that it never has before. All right, let's really talk about the building for a while. I do ask you to look up for a minute. Notice how the roof comes to a pitch. And notice, because this is American Gothic, not medieval Gothic, and it's wood instead of stone, just notice all that woodwork up there. Now imagine, if we could, flipping it so that what's up there were down here. And just think about all that wood coming to a point below rather than above. If we wanted to, we could use this roof to build a boat, if we wanted to. I'm happy to let it be the roof. But just think about the shape of the roof flipped, and it becomes the hull of a ship, right? The early church thought of itself as the ship of souls. And so we talk about the common area of a liturgical church as the nave. You are sitting right now in the nave of this church. We would not say sanctuary. Now, in reality, people are starting to say sanctuary. Uh, some of our language is kind of going the way of the dinosaur. Um, we're not going to let that happen here. Um, on my watch. We're going to still call this the nave. Not because we're being precious or not because we're tied to language of the past, but this roof is shaped to remind us that if we flipped it and built a structure on top of it, it would serve as the hull of a ship. The ship of souls. The ship that rescues people from life without relationship with God. So you've entered through the narthex or vestibule. We'll talk about the practicalities of that later. But you are in the nave of this church. And there is a reason in American Gothic the roof looks like it does. It looks like the hull of a ship, of a wooden ship, okay? Now, churches that are larger than St. Luke's, we actually have a little bit of a crossing. There's a building over here, a segment of the building, called the sacristy, and the organ works are in a building over here. If you were to fly a drone um, above the church, even a church as small as this one, you would see that it's cruciform. This building is in the shape of a cross, if you look at it from above. So we, I mean, I'm basically in the same position you are. If you could see through this organ work, you'd see that there's a bit of, bit of the building over there, and there's a little bit of it over there. If we suddenly were looking via a drone, we'd see the shape of a cross. And that's not accidental. Ancient churches typically were built in the shape of a cross to remind us every week of our Lord's sacrifice for us on the cross. So the term is cruciform, and even a church this size is cruciform, if you could see it from above. So this section we call the choir, and you may say, well, that's not terribly interesting, but the choir's not here today. Well, that's, and that's the point. The choir in a, in a liturgical church it's not just the people who sing, it's, it's where they sing. It's, it's a section of the church. So I would not call this the nave. I would call this 
the choir. So I sit on a Sunday in the choir, even though I'm not singing the anthem. All right? And then up here, this area, is what we would call the sanctuary. So if I see somebody out in public and they say, you have a beautiful sanctuary, I don't say, well, you've got the terminology wrong. Uh, it's really the nave you're talking about. I'm too gracious to do that, right? If somebody says you have a beautiful sanctuary at St. Luke's, I'll say thank you. Appreciate that. You're very kind. But we don't call this the sanctuary. This is the nave. This is the choir. And where the Eucharist happens, where we experience the presence of Christ in a localized way, where the elements that are already consecrated are kept in the tabernacle or the ombre. That's the sanctuary. It's kind of the holy of holies, if you will, looking back at the Jewish temple. Okay? So it's a special place. We know that as important as this is, and this is, all of this and this leads us there to the sanctuary where we'll experience the presence of Christ in the bread and wine. I'd like you to think about the pipes here for a second. I'm losing track of when this project was finished. It was certainly well before the pandemic. Since the 1950s until about sometime within the last 10 years, I'm not going to sweat the date. The pipes that were here dated back to the 1880s, and all the paint had faded. All you could see back then was a little bit of the yellow. The guy that oversaw this project, Dr. Kreps, by the way, on your faculty, oversaw, he, Dr. Kreps is a Renaissance man. He can bake, he's a competitive cyclist, and he can tune an organ from, from the ground up. Um, and he's a friend of mine, uh, Matt Kreps is a great, am I have Dr. Kreps? Okay, if you ever meet him, tell him how Father Joel says he's a cool guy, okay? Matthew Kreps calls this Irish buttercup yellow. I did not know that that was a thing, but apparently it is a thing, Irish buttercup yellow. But you see the lilac, you see the uh, eggshell blue. When we were renovating the organ works, the pipes had not been heard since the 1950s. They'd just been up there gathering dust and fading, losing their color. So we shipped them up to the uh, office, the factory in uh, Ohio, who got back to us and said, we can fix them and paint them, but we can't guarantee them. They're so old and they're so fragile. We can't guarantee that you'll be able to keep it in tune. So the issue was, do you want to pay so many thousands of dollars to get a refurbished set of pipes that we aren't sure are going to work or we can paint some new ones in exactly the same way the old ones were painted. And so here's the point. Um, you may think, and I think some of our own people thought at first, that's, what kind of color combination is that? Who, who thought that up? Well, somebody in the 1880s did. These are the colors that were here when those original pipes were brand spanking new. The style in the 1880s was to have multicolors and you know the lilac and the the light blue and the buttercup yellow um, i think it's just beautiful but these are new pipes but painted exactly the way the pipes were painted when they were new in the 1800s and how they were able to determine that there are beams of light that people who know what they're doing can use that are so bright and penetrate to the point where you can see through 120 years of dust and grime and find the original color, and that's what they did. So if somebody walks in in 2020 something and thinks, well, you know, that's, what, what's all that, all those colors? That's how it looked in 1880. And so that's what we did. And so uh, there are new pipes that should last longer than anybody alive. We should never have to worry about these pipes being um, unvoiced. 
but they bring back an element of this church's architectural, aesthetic appeal that had been lost for generations. Um, and so it just brings a whole segment of worship, um, just a whole new sense of um, continuity with the past. At the same time, it's new and fresh and uh, should be good for at least 100 years. Something else that's new in all this history and beauty, notice, if you will, please, there's a camera right there that's on right now. I'm pointing at it. I can see the blue light. And there's a camera back there. We started with one, and now we have two. This is the fruits of the pandemic. And we decided after the emergency was declared, um, we have to go online. I'm, I'm not very technologically savvy. Anybody who knows me will know. Somebody saw my uh, flip phone on my desk one time in my office and said, is that a prop? And I said, what? And she said, I don't mean to offend you. I thought maybe that was like a souvenir or part of the decor. I said, no, that's my phone. <laughs> that's the phone I actually use. I'm not very technologically oriented. I think a lot of bad stuff happens on social media. A lot of good stuff happens too. We knew that when the pandemic was declared to stay relevant and to stay accessible, we've got to go online. So we started, Isaac Doty is in the bell tower managing this um, recording right now. Isaac put his cell phone on a tripod that first Sunday. And Dr. Desmukes, the organist, who's a, one of your faculty members, and I, and Isaac was here, he was here then, and one or two readers maybe, about six of us maybe, I don't remember exactly, had church online for the first time in this parish's history. And so we graduated eventually from a cell phone on a tripod to one camera, and then we graduated to two. So this past Sunday morning, perfectly normal, um, I checked online after our uh, coffee hour time, our fellowship hour ended, and uh, there were 150 views um, within an hour after the church service. I checked yesterday, and there were 450 views. And uh, by the end of the week, if the week is typical, there'll be about 550. And uh, people now can watch us anywhere in the world. And so we've kept the historic space. We appreciate the symbolism that went into this building in the 1870s and 80s as it was being brought to its full completion. But this is not a museum. This is one of, th there are three oldest Episcopal churches in East Tennessee. And East Tennessee, the diocese goes from South Pittsburgh up to Bristol and over to Copper Hill uh, down here and up to uh, Crossville. So one of the other pastors of one of the other three historic churches said to me at a meeting one time, I feel like the curator of a museum. I just feel like they're keeping the building open and I feel like there's more energy around the building than worship. How do you feel in, in Cleveland? I, this is a literal conversation. Um, I said, well, I'm sorry that's your experience because I don't feel any of that. St. Luke's is alive and we're growing and you know, we're getting younger people in all the time. I said, I'm, I'm sorry that's your experience. Nobody would confuse St. Luke's for a museum. And so the cameras, I'm not just saying, hey, we're online. The cameras represent that we honor our history. It's important for us to know our history, the good and the less good. But we're also moving forward. And um, so now uh, I was teaching, I'm, I'm starting a class tonight that I taught last year. And I said, a welcome to those of you watching online anywhere in the country. And then I said, well, you know, Anywhere in the world, for that matter, if you're outside the United States, glad you're with us. And so Isaac told me later, somebody commented 
in real time. I'm watching in South Africa a live, a Christian ed class in Cleveland. So that's the church of the future. And um, I will say about St. Luke's, we, from, from really day one of the pandemic, embraced this is our reality and this is how we have to move forward. So part of what you can think about is how do we blend traditional, how do we honor history, come to terms with what's good about it and what's bad about it, and how the bad has impacted the present, and how do we, how do we remedy that, how do we reconcile uh, that. But in the end, how do we move forward? Okay. This is the day the Lord has made. He made that date in 1871, also in 1872, in 1873, in 1874. But this is the day that we have to know the love of God in Christ and to make that love known through our actions. And so this church honors its history. As rector of the parish, I deeply honor every single soul who's made this moment possible. But I'm pastoring this moment, not a hundred-year-old history. But this is the moment we've been given to know Christ and make him known. So everything in here is intentional, is kind of, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Everything in here has its symbolism, has its purpose, Ultimately, the purpose is to draw your attention to the table. And ultimately, the point of drawing your attention to the table is to say, the host who shared bread and wine with his disciples is our host today in Cleveland, Tennessee in 2022. We think that when we gather around this table through the power of the Spirit, we are experiencing the presence of Christ, not just in a generalized way. Again, general is wonderful. I'm glad that the Lord's with us when we're out and about. Um, he's with us in a different way, what we would call sacramental, in the localized presence of the Holy Spirit in the bread and wine. Uh, the colors are interesting and should be noted in an art class. Um, we are in what we call the season after Pentecost, and so um, this is the time of planting and tending and harvest, ultimately, and so the colors are green at this time of year to symbolize growth. We're meant to grow in our understanding of Christ all through the year. Um, the next major season change will be Advent in December, or late November it can be, and uh, we'll go to blue sort of a dark blue in Advent. Then we go to white for Christmas through Epiphany and then back to green um, in the late season of Epiphany and then typically purple in Lent. Purple's traditionally uh, symbolic of penitence and then white again at Easter and red on Pentecost. Uh, the church is just a flame in red, um, metaphorically, on Pentecost Sunday. Okay? And the, we have different paraments that we can uh, change out through different parts of the year. I was in a church recently, a uh, larger church than this, um, to their credit, and which is great. It's a very modern building. And it doesn't look anything like this. Um, and it really is a multi-purpose room. And good for them. I, I mean that sincerely. You can do a lot with the multi-purpose room. I was attending a fundraiser that night. It was not a church event. There was music. The music was not sacred. It was um, kind of even edgy at times and, you know, sort of Nashville. Um, and, and so I'm sitting in a church listening to music that really has nothing to do with church. And I thought, wait a minute, what's going on here? I wasn't offended. Please don't get me wrong. I was not offended. I wasn't being prudish. I thought about the space. And as I looked around that new 
church, I realized there's not even a cross in here. It's just space. I mean, there's, you know, an instru- there are instruments and there are microphones and there's color and I looked around and so there's not a cross in here. This is just space. Now, space in which the Lord can be known. Please understand that I know that. The Lord can be known anywhere and experienced anywhere. But we have a choice of how do we want to worship? Do we want to worship in space that's flexible and big? Or do we want to come through the door and experience something that tells us instantly, this isn't the grocery store. We're coming back to where we started. This isn't the gym. This isn't the parish hall. The parish hall's over there for us. We'd love to have you over there sometime. We'd love to have you after church and get to know you. Um, This isn't the courtyard. The courtyard is beautiful over here this time of year. We've got an academy that meets now here on, sun, on uh, weekdays. We've got students over there in the education building. All of it's important. But this space is different. It's, it's, it was envisioned to be marked off as holy, as set apart. And so the parish hall is vital to us. The education building is vital to us. Tending creation in the courtyard is vital to what we do. But in the end, we do all of that to do this, to experience the presence of Christ in worship. And then we're sent back out each week to show that we really believe through our actions what we verbalize and hear on a Sunday morning. So this is not an auditorium. Auditoriums are wonderful. You can do a lot in a multi-purpose auditorium. But this kind of space brings us, if we will let it, to a, I would argue, a, a, at least we have a better opportunity to have a deeper experience of the presence of Christ in, a, in an intentionally holy space. And I'm happy to introduce you to it. I am not here to evangelize you. And I'm not. I do want to say that we are in worship here on Sunday mornings at 8 and at 9.30 and 10.45. We have three services on a Sunday morning. Most of our students come at 10.45. We have students each week, as I said earlier. There is a student-led evening prayer service on Wednesdays at 5.15 in here. And it's live-streamed, but it's also in person. And so students between Lee and Cleveland State lead worship on Wednesday evenings at 515. And then on Thursdays at 1210, we have a brief service of Eucharist in here um, that's very similar to Sunday but without music and a little bit shorter sermon and uh, just a little bit less formal. So there are um, several minutes left. Um, I'd be happy to field any questions and if I don't know the answer, I'll be humbled by that, and I'll go look it up after, after we meet. I, if, I don't pretend to know everything about this building. But liturgy in general, uh, church architecture in general, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Or, Rondell, if you please, you're the professor, if you want to. I'm sure if they have questions, uh, or if you want to add anything. It's okay. I don't typically ask questions when I'm at a talk, but um, I hope I've... Uh, whetted your appetite either to come to worship here or at least to come back and, and enjoy more time here. Yes? On the glass? Yes. They're all, it all says to the glory of God uh, and in memory of um, Nina Craig Miles, the little girl who was killed. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to let you uh, kind of walk around and um, just, again, look at the carvings, uh, just kind of feel the space. Um, and if you have any questions informally, you can ask. Do you want to say anything? I'll, I'll point out a, a couple of things. I was interesting that uh, I was a little naked connection to the whole pulse. And um, one thing I think is interesting in that is think of the Holy as a whole.
so I'll admit this, this is a church I go to, um, and we did a, a, a teaching series, I guess over the summer, on stained glass in here, which, which was interesting. I've you know, been looking at the, the stained glass, um, but in context of some things that you've thought about and seen, I thought that stained glass up there was really amazing. I and mean, one, it's beautiful, but also we've talked a lot about in side of the bad side earlier, that in the medieval Catholic Church, it tends to be like the last judgment when you're coming in. And there's kind of that reminder of sin and reward and that sort of thing. And then in, in this context, as you're leaving, you've got a really sensitive dude with this kind of this Easter reference. So it, it's just interesting seeing it. it it's like a twist. It's a lot of the same language, but a slight twist. Think about like, even in our history, like if you have a, a painting of Jesus teaching the disciples or discussing with the disciples, it's almost always Jesus standing up, proclaiming to both disciples who are sitting down listening. And I, I thought that was, was kind of interesting. But in this church, and we've talked about how the architectures of different churches are affected by their theology. And you know, in some churches, especially. always the, this the elevated um, pulpit in the middle focus on proclamation whereas here everything's centered around the Eucharist but or centered around the table which I think is a, an interesting kind of shift in focus from just the proclamation of the word which is important it's done in churches like this every Sunday but to that kind of relational dialogue around the table. And it's just kind of interesting, all these like subtle ways that the architecture and the church design references the theology of the churches. And I said, in my Baptist church of growing up, we never thought about that. But it was always implicitly there. And that's what I'm hoping you guys will get out of these discussions. There's, in the liturgical traditions, there's much more of a focus on this continuity of history. There's more of a focus on kind of intentionally connecting the architecture and the theology. But when I was in a Baptist church in a strip mall, our theology and our church design were still connected. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so that's what I, that's what I'm hoping you guys will get out <coughs> of these discussions. Is that you're going forward, no matter what traditions you're in, that you think about how your worship is reflective of, and your, the structures you're worshiping in are reflective of the theology that you're believing and propagating. So, that's, that's my word for it. Okay. That's all good stuff. Did you have your hand up or not? Okay. That's fine. Again, welcome. I just want to really, in the end, start, get back to where we started. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Again, we have students here at every service of worship practically. Um, if you want to have a follow-up conversation with me about any of this, I'd love to talk to you. Um, now, just feel free to uh, come up, have a look. And um, again, I'm so glad you all came today. God bless. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Come on up. <laughs>